At this time, I would like to invite all of our World War II veterans to stand. World War II veterans. There we go. And now if the Korean War veterans will stand with them. Korean War, we have two. Our Vietnam veterans, please. We have one in the back. Gulf War I and Gulf War II and Afghanistan. Veterans, would you please stand? We have one. Those of you who've served in other conflicts and in peacetime in the United States Armed Services, please stand. No additional personnel. Those of you who are veterans of foreign armies, would you please stand? Non-American army service, would you please stand? From an, Nobody served in the army in another country? I guess not. Thank you, gentlemen. You may be seated. Give them a hand. This coming Tuesday, of course, is Veterans Day. It used to be Armistice Day until 1954. But it was uh, recognized that the Armistice of 11 p.m. on the 11th day of the 11th month in 1918 was to commemorate the war to end all wars. And so we hoped it would be. But you can hear just from the veterans and the wars that I've named, many other conflicts have taken place since that time and continue to take place. What we would hope for is that we experience an era in the not-too-distant future in which war will be no more, although certainly that doesn't look hopeful. In the meantime, we honor those who have served and appreciate uh, the debt of gratitude that we all owe those in our armed forces who have served our country with dignity and honor and valor. And we thank you. Some time back, if memory serves, I think Paul Cardi and Eric Thornburg presented Alex Varga a uh, article that had been written in the paper about him and a, a plaque commemorating that. I'm going to read that story again just because it's worth repeating and because it, it does tie to the rest of what I want to share today. For 93-year-old veteran Alex Varga, World War II is now a collection of stories. The rains of enemy fire, the stifling presence of death, and one momentous call to heroism. Serving nearly five years in Europe as a medic without a rifle, Varga was in the business of saving lives without a means of self-defense. He was drafted as a boy and, during boot camp, opted to forego a weapon for religious reasons. Varga would save lives not take them. He soaked up everything in medical training, never knowing what he would need to make the difference between life and death. Still livened by the memory, Varga described medic duties as a race against the clock coupled with a disregard for danger. He couldn't focus on his own protection, only the job ahead. I had to take care of them, whatever had to be done, he said. On the night of November 29, 1944, Varga was attached to the 1st Platoon of Company K, 407th Infantry, cramming his first aid pack full of morphine, antiseptics, and dressing. Varga readied for an advancement on the enemy and belts, Germany. Again, he did not pick up a weapon. I felt that this freed me to do my job of saving lives unencumbered by extra weight or the temptation to take life, Varga wrote in a reflection on his service. Settled into muddy, two-feet-deep foxholes, his platoon waited through a cold, lonely night, listening as the echo of artillery fire drew ever nearer. A nearby explosion signaled the beginning of the advancement, and Varga's duties began. Paying attention to nothing else, Varga was to follow his platoon, responding to calls of, Medic! 
medic. When someone calls for a medic, one goes, regardless of the danger he might encounter, Varga wrote. Tending to his first wounded soldier of the day, Varga immediately fell behind the platoon. He quickly dressed a flesh wound and marked the fallen soldier with a rifle covered in a white bandage, striking it to the ground. This would signal to others that the soldier needed to be taken to the aid station. Quickly, Varga ran to catch up, only to be called again by the holler, Medic! Medic! Running from injury to injury, Varga spent a full day chasing calls and catching up, constantly under fire of enemy machine guns. When he finally caught up, a sergeant pointed to an injured soldier atop a hill. Crawling to meet him, he began dressing the wound. As enemy fire opened over his head, a bullet bounced off Varga's helmet and struck his patient in the shoulder. Remaining under fire, Varga dressed the two fresh wounds under the eye of his sergeant. For this act, Varga later found out he had earned a Silver Star Medal awarded for gallantry in action against an enemy. That day, Varga saved at least a dozen lives. It has been one of the longest days of my life, he wrote. Looking back, it is amazing how one does what one has to. I did my best, and I am grateful to be whole and be able to tell my story. Thank you, Alex, for your story. Among the many things that we value in this country, among the many things that we respect, among the many things we admire, our military is generally high on the list. We're a nationalistic group, proud group, and we know what it takes to be a leader in the world, and so we've had a great deal of pride through the years in our military and those who've served. And we emulate that in some ways. And I want to turn that admiration and emulation in the direction that moves us all, um, hopefully, toward an understanding of the way in which we participate in this as followers of Christ. You see, in the story about Alex, he had a sergeant present, somebody who commanded him, somebody who told him what to do, and he did it without thought for his own safety or his own life. The sergeant said, there's someone up on that hill who needs your attention, and Varga went. He went. A command was given, and he went. It wasn't a question. It wasn't something he got to dialogue about. It wasn't he said, you know, I don't know if I can do that right now because there's somebody over there shooting at that guy, and I could get hit. He didn't say, you know what, I, I could die. I don't think I'm up for that. He didn't say, you know what, I think you're wrong. I'm not going to attack it the way you're suggesting. I'm going to go around the backside and crawl up over to the left and flank that, and then we'll get it done. The sergeant told him to go, and he went. As veterans will tell you, when you're given a command, what do you do, men? Follow orders. You obey. There's something about that that works in situations of crisis, that works in situations of peril, that works in situations where chain of command is so obviously required. And in our stories today, we find something of that same element. And I want to uh, connect that for you as we review the stories that we just heard The New Testament story we heard, the Gospel reading, focuses on a centurion. This is a commander, a commander of hundreds, not thousands, hundreds. A centurion was a ranking officer of a platoon, if you will, a troop of men, and when he gave orders, orders were to be carried out. It was centurions who would give orders to soldiers to nail Jesus to the cross. And it would be a centurion, a Roman, a foreigner, a man from an army opposed to Israel and God's people, who would be the first to acknowledge as Jesus breathed his last, surely this was, finish the sentence with me, the Son of God. 
in Scripture we have this powerful portrayal of generals and men of foreign armies who say the most remarkable things in relationship to the service and power of God. So we have the story of the centurion at the cross. He's watched the entire execution process. He's ordered his men to crucify three that day. One has died very early and prematurely, Jesus, after only six hours on the cross. But two are still alive, and he orders the breaking of their bones so that they can no longer push themselves up to breathe. Of Jesus, he says, as the body has given up its last breath, this was surely the Son of God. An admission so profound that we only find it a few times through the Gospels. We only find this recognition a couple of times in the entire story of Jesus. To make that kind of leap takes an insight and a faith that is truly remarkable. But our story from the Gospel today focused on a centurion who had another issue. You see, Jerusalem wasn't that big of a city. People heard stories. They knew who was who. They knew Jesus. They knew what he did. They knew what he talked about. The Romans were constantly looking for insurrectionists and problem makers. They had their spies. They had their informants. We think of biblical times as something separate and weird, but we are talking about principalities and powers. We're talking about governments. We're talking about state matters. We're talking about foreign affairs. We're talking about foreign occupations. Do you think we sit in Afghanistan in a little hut somewhere and drink coffee with our soldiers? We've got spies. We've got networks. We've got surveillance. We've got all kinds of things going on. And we think of that as happening now in this century, but we don't think of it as happening in first century Palestine. Only it did. The Romans were very well aware of what was happening around them in Judah, that province that they had taken over, that troublemaking province. They had their eyes on John the Baptist. They had their eyes on Jesus. They heard what the religious elite were saying about them. And now a centurion out of nowhere, maybe he's one who's been informed, maybe he's heard Jesus teach, maybe he's stood at the periphery and watched people be healed. The gospel doesn't tell us. It simply says that one day a trusted servant, a beloved servant, became ill, deathly ill. And the centurion, with all of the technologies available to him as a Roman citizen and the medicines and capabilities that they had, and by the way, those were greater than we estimate as well. With all of that at his disposal, he could do nothing. So he went to Jesus. And he didn't go to Jesus as an inferior, and he didn't go to Jesus as a uh, occupied person or a um, defeated people. He went to Jesus as a Lord and a Master. Listen to what he says, because it's compelling. A centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. Lord, a commander of hundreds says to Jesus, Lord, Kurios. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? Well aware of the customs of the Jews, the clean and unclean, the distinction between Jew and Gentile, and all of the regulations that that entailed, the centurion understood that it might not be at all right for Jesus to enter his home in the eyes of his countrymen. For Jesus, it might not be a positive to come into the house of a Roman. For Jesus, it might not be good for his reputation. It might not be good for his ministry. And the centurion humbly replies, Lord, I don't deserve to have you come under my roof. The 
captor says to the captive, the dominator says to the dominated, the occupier says to the occupied, I'm not worthy to come into your house. Roman soldier, the big man, the one with the stripes on his shoulder, says, I'm not worthy to have you in my home. And then he quickly says something absolutely stunning. I'm seeking for myself a faith this great. I would for all of us a faith this profound. He says, but just say the word. Just say the word. Just give the command and my servant will be healed. Here's how he understands this. He says, I'm a man under authority, and then there are people under me. If I tell this one go, and he goes, and I tell that one come, and he comes, I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. The man of command. He's the one giving the orders. The one used to be in control only. In this situation, he's not in control. He's speaking to one greater than himself, and he says, you understand command. I know you understand command. And all you need to do is say the word, because you have command of things that I don't. I command a hundred men, but you command angels and demons. You command sickness and wellness. You command hope and healing, and you command life itself. Speak. Say the word, and my servant will be well. Jesus says, or when he heard it, he was amazed. There's that word, amazed. This word is usually applied to people observing Jesus in action. Over and over again, we read in the Gospels, and the disciples were amazed. In this case, Jesus is amazed. And he said to those around him, those who follow him, those who claim to believe in him, truly I tell you, I've not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I tell you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown out into darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. He says this because the chosen ones, the ones who say they believe, have not believed. And there needs to be space at the table for those who have. Jesus said to the centurion, Go, let it be done as you believed it would. And his servant was healed at that very moment because guess what? The centurion was right. Jesus was the commander of forces greater than his own. I love that story. I love it for so many different dimensions. But I love the way it speaks to command and to military and authority. For whatever powers present on earth, whatever greatness we might think of, Jesus commands everything. Our Old Testament story is the archetype of the New Testament story. Elijah is a forerunner of Jesus, and his servant Elisha takes over his work. And so we have in the Old Testament a prototype of the story that will be told with the centurion in the New Testament, only this time it is a commander named Naaman. Again, you see the chain of command. Naaman is accountable to a king and is in charge of many, but he's broken. This time it's not a servant who suffers. It is a servant who gives him advice about where to go, but he suffers the incurable leprosy. So he goes to his king and said, I've heard of a prophet. I've heard of someone in Israel who can fix my problem. And the king loads him with wealth. If you read that carefully, if you see what he takes in his train as an ambassadorial gift to the king of Israel and to the one who would heal him, it is a significant fortune. 
a significant fortune. He goes bearing these gifts, not trying to incite war, but he gets audience with the king of Israel. It's an international event again. It's an international happening. It's not something that's just isolated to something simple. This is the king of one country appealing to the king of another for safe passage for his general and for healing for his general. Well, you see that the king of Israel reads this as a trap, is very upset. Even though he knows what's going on in his own country, he doesn't have the faith to remember that there is a prophet in Israel. He tears his clothes. He's upset at what comes. And Elisha hears of it and says, send him to me so that the people may know that there is indeed a prophet in Israel, that God will speak, for he is the commander. Naaman comes, and it's almost comical, isn't it? Elisha tells him, go dip in the River Jordan seven times. If you've been to the River Jordan, you know that it's a little bit uh, on the greenish side, a little bit on the muddy side, and it is cold beyond belief. And our general thinks of his rivers in Damascus as far superior. For that matter, why not a bath? And he's insulted, and he's angry. And he's ready to take his goods and go. And his servants speak sense to him again. Master, look, if something great had been required of you, wouldn't you do it? All right, yeah, I would. Try it. What have you got to lose? So it's a dirty river. Go. What have you got to lose? Seven. There's that number. Seven times he dips and emerges whole a new creation on the memorial of creation. His skin is new and his testimony is clear. Of course, he offers Elisha all kinds of things and Elisha refuses. And he tells him this wonderful thing. He says, May the Lord forgive your servant this one thing. When my master enters the temple of Ramon to bow down, and he is leaning on my arm, and I have to bow there also, when I bow in the temple of Ramon, may the Lord forgive your servant for this. And Elisha said, as you have said. God is not arbitrary. He understands the context of this man, and he's brought him to faith through his servant a commander in an army, one who's used to saying go and having people go and come and having people come. I'm wondering if, rather than just the form of things, we start to pay attention and emulate the substance of things. I wonder if there's an emulation that comes out of admiration I wonder if there's an emulation that comes and yields an obedience, an imitation. Because the greatest figure that we have, that we say is Lord and commander of all, is Jesus Christ. It's not a centurion. It's not an ancient soldier from a foreign army. It's not a commander of human forces. It's a commander of all things divine. Lord of heaven and earth. I'm wondering if in our admiration for all things valiant and noble, service that's true, we might see Christ in this light and our responsibility to first emulate him. I wonder if faith might be found in us as it was found in Naaman that day long ago, reticent as he was, and faith that was found in that centurion more recently but still so long ago. I wonder if we might really believe that God could command it and it might be so. I wonder if we could act as if that were true. 
Our Ephesians reading says, Follow God's example, therefore, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. What would it look like if we were soldiers in an army of peace? What would it look like if we were ambassadors of the Spirit, living as this passage mentions? Imitators, therefore, of Christ. Followers of the one who commands all. It's just a thought. And I think it's a thought that could be a revolution. But only you and I get the chance to live that. And so I hope that we will focus most our admiration on the one who deserves it most. That our respect and our admiration will first go to Christ and will seek to emulate that which we admire. And that like so many who've experienced chain of command, we might go when he tells us to go and come when he tells us to come and understand that in the end, he gives us an order of things that's to our benefit. For how wondrous would it be to sing and make music from our hearts to the Lord, giving thanks to God the Father always for everything in the name of Jesus Christ.